morning. Um, you're all going to have to forgive me for having lost so much of my Irish accent. Um, I get a lot of grief for this whenever I come back here. Um, I'm actually speaking at another event uh, on Saturday. I'm speaking at Y Combinator Startup School at Stanford. Um, two years ago, Brian Chesky from Airbnb spoke at Startup School back in 2010. Um, and he opened his talk by showing a picture from Startup School in 2008, two years previously. Um, and in 2008, he was, he was just an anonymous head in the audience. Two years later, 2010, he was on stage at Startup School. And as it happens, I was at his talk in 2010. Uh, I was one of those anonymous heads in the audience. Uh, and so it's kind of a funny symmetry. Um, Stripe definitely isn't as far along as Airbnb. And more than anything else, when I was watching his talk, I just I thought, how weird it must be to, to be in Airbnb. Startups are just really strange for a bunch of reasons. And the most successful ones, the Airbnbs, they're just incredibly hard to wrap your head around. I remember somebody telling me not all that long ago that Airbnb was making $10,000 a week. It was huge. And now I have no idea what Airbnb's actual revenues are, but it wouldn't shock me at all if they're making $10,000 an hour. What's it even like to build a company where something like that is possible? Aside from exponential growth like that, startups are hard to understand for a couple more reasons. Those that take off are usually kind of counterintuitive, because otherwise somebody else would have already done it. Uh, on top of that, startups often don't want to be very well understood, uh, especially if they're doing well. Uh, it can be very helpful to be sort of underestimated and undercomprehended. But really, I think the biggest reason that startups are hard to understand is that so few people still get to see them up close, uh, especially during the early days and the, the first couple of orders of magnitude. And when people do tell those stories, they tend to get them all wrong. The stories are about rocket ships and frantically trying to buy more server capacity to handle the next million users, and not about sort of the, the late night arguments and wondering if your product could ever possibly work, or trying to figure out you know, why your amazing product just isn't growing. And the thing is, even the most successful companies have this phase. Most people don't know this, um, but that famous summer when Facebook moved out to Palo Alto, people living in the same house were still working on, on other startup ideas. Like this is Facebook, the most successful company, technology company started in the 21st century, six months after launch. Stripe, our company, um, it's very different to Facebook and Airbnb. And I definitely can't compare ourselves to them. We've now gone through a small bit of growth, and I want to try to describe how it actually works. In October of 2009, John and I were walking home from dinner in Potrero in San Francisco, and we'd been sort of kicking around this idea of starting an online payments company. We were fascinated by the concept of internet payments, because sort of as the web spread around the world and more deeply into our lives through, through mobile devices, it seemed obvious that there should be a universal payments infrastructure for the internet that it should be really easy to transact online. Um, and John just sort of turned to me as we were walking along, and he said, you know, let's just do it. It probably won't be all that hard. Um, he actually said that. Uh, and so I said, all right, I'm in. To backtrack a little bit for anybody who doesn't know, John's my co-founder at Stripe. He's also my brother. Um, People often ask me about how this works in practice. Uh, and so for the record, starting a company with your brother turns out to be a really good idea. Um, John's not only one of the most brilliant people I know, um, he got 10 A's in his leaving cert. Uh, I can say that here and people actually understand it. Um, but he's someone with whom I've, I've literally decades of experience building things. Um, this was one of our earlier ventures. Um, but it's OK. It's October 2009, and we decided to work on this online payments company. We decided to call it Dev Payments. Um, everyone else had sort of been treating online payments um, as something that finance people should care about and targeted their product at CFOs and at business people. And we sort of thought that the internet was moving in a different direction. Um, we decided to target makers, the people actually building things. We thought that payments was really just a, a technology problem, and we wanted to make it easier for people to participate in the internet economy. And so we worked nights and weekends. We were in college at the time. Uh, I was at MIT, and John was up the street at Harvard. And we'd code in the evening between problem sets and papers. January rolled around, which in Boston is unbelievably freezing. So John and I decided to go somewhere to work for the month. We'd read a few blogs that claimed that Buenos Aires was a, a really great place to get things done. It's cheap, and it's warm, and it's friendly. Everything opens really late, and there's, there's Wi-Fi everywhere. Um, it's basically a city designed for programmers. Um, 
And so John and I went there, and we just worked nonstop for three weeks. I've still never seen any of the tourist attractions in, in Buenos Aires. Um, we coded in cafes all day. Then we stopped for dinner at around 11 o'clock at night. On January 9th, 2010, Dev Payments got its first production user. Now, this was only a few weeks after we'd started to work on it. Um, but we really wanted to have production users shaping the product as early as possible. The user was a friend of ours, uh, Ross Boucher. Uh, and 14 months later, he actually joined Stripe as our fifth hire. Uh, here's a screenshot of what Dev Payments looked like at the time. Uh, as you can see, John and I are definitely programmers and not designers. Um, but OK, we now have one user. Um, there's this story at Amazon uh, about how they celebrated when they got their first buyer who wasn't any of their moms. Um, and in our case, the user wasn't our mom, but it, he was a good friend, and so we weren't out of the woods just yet. Um, so this is three months in. So we went back to school, and we continued to work on dev payments in our spare time. Uh, there was one cafe I worked at so much that I'm, I'm still Facebook friends with a bunch of the baristas there. They sort of took pity on me. Um, Stripe is a sort of unusual company. It's about technology, but it's, it's also about payments. We sort of span two industries. And the technology side requires sort of really good reliability and clean APIs and a good product and so on. And these were all things that we at least hoped to know a little bit about. But the payment side also required working with banks and dealing with credit card companies and generally handling a slew of finance industry issues that we hadn't previously encountered. We had a lot of meetings where I sat somebody down and said, right, payments, how they work. Um, and programmers often, uh, unfortunately, look down on people who are learning to code, the, the sort of, hi, I want to learn Rails for my web startup people. But I actually have a lot of sympathy for them, because we were basically that, but in finance. Summer came around, so we're now six months in. We moved out to Palo Alto, though we hadn't yet decided to take leave from college. We found a tiny bungalow. Um, the living room and the kitchen became the office. It was hot, but we didn't have any air conditioning, so John just slept in the garden most nights. Um, he wouldn't allow me to post a photo of that. Uh, and by and large, we just kept on writing code. That's mostly what starting a software company looks like in the early days, because anything that isn't writing code or interacting with the people who will use it is probably just a waste of time. Here's a chart of our transaction volume um, for the first six months. Uh, and that's not a technical error. The numbers just aren't very big. If you look really closely, you can sort of see a wiggly line at the bottom. Um, it's admittedly not wiggling very much. Um, we, we also, around this time, raised our first investment from Peter Thiel and Paul Graham. Uh, I'm sure many of you probably know Peter Thiel as one of the first investors in Facebook, um, as well as PayPal's first CEO. Uh, up to then, we hadn't told many people about dev payments, and those that we had told had uh, reacted by telling us that we were crazy. But luckily, Paul Graham and Peter Thiel are crazy, um, in a good way. Um, and they invested a little bit over 200,000 between them. So we made it to the end of the first year. We moved into our first office. Um, it looked something like this. It had previously been a house. It had a wonderful fireplace. That looked something like this. I think it was probably in contravention of fire in the workplace codes. Um, and we were still just working nonstop. Uh, we hired somebody else. Um, uh, we, we hired our first person, actually. We were based in Silicon Valley, home to the best international talent from you know, Berlin to Beijing to Bangalore. And so, of course, we took full advantage of that, and we hired Dara Butley, who was one of my smartest friends from college. Um, Dara grew up in Anacati in Limerick. Um, we heard another guy, Greg. Uh, when Greg was joining, I remember him asking um, you know, whether we worked weekends. And we did, but I, I didn't want to make it seem like he'd have to. And so I was saying, you know, well, you know, we work some weekends, but we really care about work-life balance. And, and Greg just cut me off. He's like, great, I'm glad we're on the same page about working all day, every day. We also decided to change our name. Um, I can't even begin to describe the problems that dev payments had. Uh, we'd started to receive mail with names like this. Uh, Amazon had launched a product called DevPay, and it just obviously was not going to work out. So we spent hours brainstorming names, and we eventually came up with Stripe. So anyway, we reached the end of the first year. We're now four people, a couple of Y Combinator startups that started to use Stripe. Um, here's what our transaction volume looked like at the end of the first year, one year in. Still a little bit of work to do. Um, we spent January 2011, uh, our one-year anniversary in Rio de Janeiro, since January in South America was uh, becoming a tradition. Rio de Janeiro, as anyone has ever uh, been knows, is one of the most beautiful places on Earth. Um, we took full advantage of it. Uh, now, there are some obvious things we could have done to grow faster, uh, most notably to launch. We are still an invite-only private beta. Uh, a friend recently referred to this as the 
baby blanket phase of startups. Um, but we weren't just building a thin software layer. We thought Stripe should encompass everything from the API to how the money ended up in your bank account. We wanted to be able to define the complete experience, and we wanted to be able to do it at scale. So that meant working with really good banks. However, banks and startups are basically the business equivalent of oil and water, and figuring out how to combine them was sort of a challenge. The best in the business was Wells Fargo, which powers some of the largest payments companies in the world. But it was pretty hard to, to get them to even talk to us or like to reply to our emails. And they probably thought we were some kind of strange Nigerian scam, you know, accept payments online and make money fast. Um, so we asked a friend and an investor, uh, Jeff Ralston, to help us out. Um, he'd previously worked at a company called Lala, uh, and it was a music company, and he had successfully negotiated with a bunch of record labels. And we figured that if you could convince a record label to work with a technology startup, you could convince anybody to do anything. Um, Here's a picture of him on a conference call at our office. Uh, and he's actually on the floor upstairs um, because our office was also flooded at the time. Um, and so sometimes startups just feel like a reality TV show, right? Uh, like, negotiate with one of the biggest banks in the world while wading through water. Um, and the water is full of piranhas or something. Um, but anyway, thanks to the help of Jeff and a couple of others, we eventually convinced Wells Fargo to become one of our back ends. This meant moving all of our systems to work on top of their platform. And it was a few weeks of very intense work. This was the night of our first successful transaction. Um, this is John after a, previously six, or a particularly long all-nighter. Um, I'm so in for a lot of retribution during John's next talk. Um, but in general, this is the really unglamorous phase of a startup, and the, the part that sort of people don't talk about very much. Um, you really want to make something work, and lots of others think it's a bad idea, and it's very hard. And, Everything takes longer than you'd like. Uh, and you just, you have all these sort of doubts, right? Uh, like you're constantly wondering, you know, can this ever work? Or is it all about to fall apart? Or may maybe it's a good idea, but you just can't pull it off. Eventually, we got all the pieces in place, and we were ready to launch. Um, we launched September 2011, um, just over a year ago. Um, here's the tweet where we announced it. Um, at the time, Stripe had been in production use for 19 months. Uh, we've been working on it full time for a year and three months. We were seven people when we launched. I was able to fit all of the names in a tweet. Um, and by the end of the year, here's what our daily transaction volume looked like. Launching definitely isn't a panacea. But the signs were positive, and we, we kept going. Um, and over the last few months, um, about just over two years in, um, two and a half years, I guess, we've finally started to become an overnight success. Um, this is our average daily transaction volume uh, uh, through to today. Um, and it's really just growing like crazy. Stripe is now 34 people, um, which is twice as many people as are in this picture. Uh, but we're a startup, and we haven't had time to take a new group photo yet. And thousands of companies are using Stripe to accept payments. Um, a lot of new ones are going live every day. Then there's, there's some well-known ones like you know, Foursquare and Boxy and even MoMA in New York. Um, but there's also some less well-known ones that are really interesting, like uh, Culture Kitchen, which delivers ethnic food and teaches you how to cook it, um, or Samosource, which brings uh, computer-based work opportunities to people living in poverty, the EFF, which is a lot of you probably know is kind of defending rights online, and even Bedford Cheese Shop, um, which is selling its cheeses online. Um, you can sort of tell I was hungry when I was putting these together. So that's our path through to today. Um, we often describe what we're doing as building economic infrastructure for the internet. The internet has revolutionized how we communicate and how we collaborate and how we share. Um, but we've only started to explore how it can, how it can change what we create and, and how we transact. Like For most of human history, um, we've had to buy from the people beside us, the people sort of proximate in space. But thanks to the internet, that's no longer true. Anyone can now create a global business. But that potential hasn't yet been realized uh, as much as it should be. Um, and we started Stripe to fix that. So that's the story of the beginning, um, the first two and a half years. Um, and we're really excited about what's yet to come. Thank you.